Hello, Guardians. Welcome back to Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Corey Derrigan. Alongside me, as always, is my tier for the kingdom, my Final Fantasy, my field of stars, if you will, my Redfall, <laughs> Josh. Oh, Finney. no. <laughs> you could, I couldn't have been the Jedi survivor? No. Ugh, you bitch. It's too good. You too bitch. Good. Too good. By the way, man, that latest trailer for Jedi Survivor. I know we're going to talk a little bit about it later, but looks pretty oh good. Oh my god, I'm I'm I, I stayed away from that too. I was telling Corey before we started. I was like, yeah, man, it's it's kind of a short week, like for the Chwab, and uh, you know we've got a bunch of listener questions, but yeah, kind of in a weird place on Lore Corner and the seasonal story. It was really short, so it's wrapped up. We've talked ad nauseum about the raid and about the storylines and things on Niamuna. Like, I don't really have a whole lot to talk about tonight. Like, let's let's do a check in on like what we're excited for. Uh, get the questions last week kind of spurred me into wanting to do this uh, yeah. since it's a short week. Uh, also, also, I have a I have a pickle to 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 pick with our uh, with our audience. This this hashtag cancel Corey culture here going hashtag on. Hashtag cancel Corey. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I was telling Corey, I was like, man, I've stay I've successfully stayed away from like every story trailer. Or like extensive footage that's come out in the last couple days for Final Fantasy 16, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. I've stayed away from all of it. I have not watched any. I, I've seen the Ganondorf image going around with the caption, oh no, he's hot. I know. And oh one gosh. of my all-time favorite voice actors is doing Ganondorf, Matt, Mer yeah. uh, Matt Mercer. Huge. I'm a huge Critical Role fan. I, I love Matt in like everything he does. So this is a dream come true for him to be doing Ganondorf. Um, well, Josh, I have a special voice actor myself here. Oh, you know. oh, we got it. We got a special. Uh, that's right. That's right. Hold it down. I'll keep an eye out for Fallen. Aha. We have Dinkleback Bot has made a special appearance for the first time in nine years. Amazing. Oh, Dinklebot. Corey finally got a Dinklebot, ladies and gentlemen. I did. I did. I I went out and found one. He's so cool. You know, he's uh. Man, I forgot how bad the voice acting was for Ghost with Dick Colbot. I'm sorry. It's so bland. Oh, man. I'm so glad they, they decided to uh, go a different direction. But, yeah, man. That was... Yeah, so I, I... So here's the thing, guys. Ghost Edition. Check. Witch Queen. Check. Lightfall. Edition. <laughs> kind of check. I was really upset, Josh. I told you a little bit before the show. You, you did, you but, did. But so it came. It came in the mail, right? The top of the box is busted. the The slip, the slip cover, totally just gone for some reason. I wonder if the box was broken into. Uh, so you are like the third person that I've seen post today about having a da a severely damaged box that a bungee item came in yeah it was weird it was really weird how this was how this how this came and so like i contacted bungee support uh the good news there's actually a lot of good news for this they're sending me another one and they not making me return the old one because i sent them pictures of it and uh yeah so i'm i we're gonna what a little tease here. We might save it for a little uh, episode 150 surprise. Some of this stuff. So hint, hint. Yeah. Nudge, nudge. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so I'll have that Lightfall collector's edition sometime in the next three to five days. Because we are uh, we are roughly 10 episodes away from. Uh, well, not roughly. We are exactly 10 episodes away from episode 150. I know. Man, that's crazy. Can you believe that? I I still don't I still don't believe that. It's still a little unbelievable, I'll be honest. Yeah. So I so Josh, as you know, I've been archiving a lot of my old podcasts and YouTube stuff that I used to do. Yes. And I finally archived all of my old Destiny show, a whopping forty six episodes, everybody, of uh DNA Weekly Strike, your weekly Destiny podcast. Oh man, that way back in the day. Yeah, running running from uh, the dark below all the way through uh, Rise of Iron. So, 
all Good the time. way through the rise of iron. Yeah. And uh, on weeks we didn't have anything to talk about, instead of just taking the week off, we talked about things like Overwatch, The Division, Dark Souls 3 at one point. Dark it Souls funny. 3. It was. It's funny, because one of the episodes of that show is actually... Uh, because, remember when The Division came out and everybody was like, oh, this is the Destiny Killer. It's it. This is it. Yes. And like, it was funny. The one episode in the battle between The Division and Destiny, uh, Dark, Soul, Dark Souls wins or something. <laughs> It was really unbelievable fun. unbelievable oh man good times good, good times. times well but Corey, before we get into some some non-destiny goodness tonight yeah let's uh let, let's do let's do a brief rundown of uh of a few items in the twop not nothing too nothing too big brained here but uh well, i want, want to get to some twops some some twops some twabs um so the, i mean first off it it's not like Oh my god, like we're not running around being like, oh my god, this is a massive twab, but there is a pretty big nugget that's dropped in here um, regarding uh, third-party peripherals. Uh, this has oh. been the scourge of specifically the PC PvP community for a very long time. Oh. Um, and I'm so excited we get to finally talk about this. Uh, we'd heard that they were looking for their own in-house solutions to uh, shut things like... Um, <clears throat> Uh, like aimbots and whatnot. They do not specifically name any of them by name here because they don't want to draw more attention to them. But uh, let's uh, let, let's read exactly what Bungie has to say here. The community has grown increasingly frustrated by a form of cheating that uses third-party peripherals with the intent to manipulate the game client. These devices are plugged into a computer or console where they can, for example, execute simple scripts or trick the game into giving you extra aim assist. You'll note that we aren't calling them by out by name. The primary reason is we simply don't want to offer a bigger spotlight than necessary. Instead, the focus is on what the impact of using tools like this has on a PvP environment. That and Bundy has adopted the following policy on any form of external aids. Bungie embraces the use of external accessibility aids that enhance or that enable and and, ex, and blah, enable an experience that game designers intended, but will take action, including bans on people who have used these tools specifically to gain an advantage over players. So let's break down what that means. So external accessibility aids are any device or input that augments the player's ability to control the game beyond what the game itself normally provides. This includes, but is not limited to, programmable controllers, keyboard and mouse adapters, uh, advanced macros, or automation via art artificial intelligence. This does not include features that Bungie provides. For more information, accessibility of Bungie. Experience the game and the game designers intended means content meant to be difficult or prestige is designed like that for a reason. We do not intend for difficulty to be automated away via software or hardware. Therefore, simply using an accessibility aid to play Destiny 2 where a player could not play otherwise would not be a violation of this policy. Using these tools to mitigate challenges all players face, such as reducing recoil or increasing aim assist, would be a violation. Gain and advantage means used for the purpose directly or indirectly of achieving victory. For example, some players that abuse these tools rise in PvP ranks at a rate far beyond what is expected for a player improving through typical play. Because the benefits of cheating in PvE can affect things like the World First Race or even spill over into PvP, we will be evaluating all gameplay for violations. So basically, don't use aimbots. If you use macros, for example, we, we have a few friends who... Uh, we use macros for things like well skating and uh, shatter skating and things like that. I do not think that that itself is necessarily a problem. Um, that's not what I'm taking away here. What I'm taking away is like, you know, paying for, for inputs and paying for cheats and plugins. Uh, there are plugins for controllers, but whereas like programming a controller that, uh, that has paddles on it, for example, um, or as one of those scuff, con or a scuff controller is not a violation. <laughs> yeah. So um that's that's the takeaway here. I don't think we have a problem with any of this in our community. Um, but just you know, so we're all clear on it that that's what's going on. Bungie has finally figured out a way that hey, we can ban this shit. Um, because there is way too much of it that shows up every single trials and iron banner week. I see nothing but a million and a half tweaks about this. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot of stuff going on on Twitter today, too, of like, oh, they didn't waste any time banning me. I'm like, haha, you suck. Yeah, congratulations. You told on yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> there's there's one. Of, there's literally one of like three things that we have to talk about. Um, the uh, the fashion commendation 
Uh, we'll yeah. be coming with the mid-season patch, which is currently, I believe, being aimed for next week. I think next Tuesday is when it's aiming to be put out. Um, before Lightfall, once Lightfall launched, we saw the feedback over and over again. I just want best dress commendation, or I'm just giving the commendations to teammates with the best outfits, and so on and so on. Um, it is important to note they were working on this, and then they were having problems getting it to work, so they uh, they pushed it from the launch of season 20 to next season, and then we're like, well, we got to move it up now. So, um, best dressed is not going to have a large commendation score, but fashion is never about getting the highest score, just the most accolades. Uh, best dress combinations are also, also are restricted to what we call low trust activities, match made activities that don't rely on significant communication or team play, not raids and dungeons, not trials. And if you think your clan mate is the best dressed, you can tell them this is not a high school award. Best dress is about giving stranger a compliment. So I kind of like that little wrinkle. I'm sure that there are going to be several, uh, who, uh, well, a good chunk of players who will be very upset about that, but I also agree, like, I don't think that you should rack up a large combination score for uh, fashion just based off, like, the two or three people you play with the most. Right. Just, like, getting, like, the mercy compliment. Um, but I will often see people when I run, uh, like, Vanguard Strikes or when I run, uh, you know, uh, what, are you, what do you call them? Battlegrounds or Crucible matches where I'm like, oh, my God, like, I really love that. I would really love Vanguard the- Ops, Josh. Vanguard Ops. I really love the uh, I really love the drip here, and uh, I want I want to make sure that people know it. I, I and again I like that it's not able to be given to people that are you are in the same clan with. No, Johnny, that does not mean that I will be showering you with this uh, accolade. Um, John and I are not in the same clan, so that's technically Rip a way John. around this. R- R.I.P. A one Johnny. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to the labs, the trials labs. We have two more trials labs on week 8 and 11 of season 20. And both were testing the new matchmaking parameters to gather analytics and verify they work as intended on the larger scale. Um, and then there is, there's a lot here. It'll be the, uh, well, the challenger pool and the practice pool there. Uh, very excited. You will not, however, have the new uh, cards in effect. So that does not mean you, are, you will have two losses forgiven on a card of mercy, for example. Um, that will not take effect until the beginning of season 21. Um, and same with the uh, changes to Gilded Flawless. So uh, more about that uh, later this season. Uh, it sounds like they will probably give it to us uh, probably towards the end of April. Probably around the time Guardian Games is starting is when we'll get uh, more Trials updates. And uh, yeah, that that's it. That's, that's... A... That's, that's your the, twab. That's the twab, guys. It is very, very short. But you didn't talk about the kilts. I did not Josh. talk about the kilts. I completely ignored the kilts. That's um, fine. Kilts for kids. Yeah. There you go. It's a cool emblem, though. Sort of. Um, If you're sure. into the plaid Irish theme type thing. Sure, sure, sure. Um, if you have fifty dollars to donate, uh, there you go. Um, it's uh, benefits to Ronald McDonald House in Seattle, so always a worthy cause. Yes, 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 go support. yes. Go support. It's for the kids, the guys. Kids. Come on, it's it's for the children. All right, Corey. All right, Josh. So it's time. It, it, it's it's time. We. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about like what we're looking forward to in the coming months because the coming months are going to be extremely packed for us. Yeah, <laughs> um, no kidding. The end of April through the end of June, uh, that sixty day time period is one of the most packed in terms of AAA releases that are like prestige AAA releases that we've seen in a very long time. Just to like run down off the top of my head, games that are coming out in that sixty day span. Yeah, go and I mean. When I say this, it's games that are going to get significant attention, whether it's positive or negative. Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Arcane Studios is Redfall. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Street Fighter VI. Uh, Diablo IV. Final Fantasy XVI. Am I missing any, Am I missing anything? Uh, In terms of a major release, am I missing anything? I don't think so. I don't not, think I am either. Not through June, at least. I think no. that's... 
just for that 60 days though that is that's a lot i mean you could count advance wars for some people i guess but i mean advance wars i i i will be playing advance wars so yeah yeah that's what seven eight games something like that yeah that's that's a lot for this early in the year we normally would see an onslaught like that like from september to november yeah, I think people are finally realizing that it's okay to release games in the summer. <laughs> I mean, you're going to have... You're gonna it's have a good what? thing Suicide Squad got delayed. Am I right? Oh my god. Got delayed right into the final shape. I, um, I mean, by by my count, you have four contender, four game of the year contenders right there. Like that people yeah. expect based on the yeah. quality and the prestige of their studios with Jedi survivor, Zelda, Diablo and final fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, cause I've, I've been very clear about it. fallen order was my game of the year in 2019. Um, very much looking forward to the next installment in that franchise. Yeah. I think, I think Jedi fallen order specifically, um, it was for me. It was great. It ha- it was a little rough around the edges, but I think that I think the way that Disney has been handling their game gaming division lately, and just the way that people are paying attention to polish mm-hmm. now, it seems that uh, this game is going to be squeaky clean when it comes out, and it looks great. I mean, and a, I a lot of that, cool. I would say, I, I don't know how much say he has over uh, like Lucasfilm games, but uh, John Drake going over there uh he left sony to go to uh disney to be their like kind of head of gaming Uh, yeah i would i would say that he's probably responsible for uh, oh josh you forgot you forgot the biggest release on april 18th josh is this uh disney kart racers disney speedstorm guess who season one's battle pass character is josh it's figment it's figment just saying really excited are you gonna pay money to auto complete the battle pass yeah to get figment yeah <laughs> never change Corey. please never change I, I won't i won't you should i mean my figment collection there's all my figures are up there and all of my little stuffed animals are back there so uh, i mean if you if you grew up going to uh the disney world you do love figment so i love figment anyways <laughs> i had to get that in there um yeah, I mean, Jedi Survivor sounds really cool. Um, I've, again, intentionally stayed away from as much of it as I can. Uh, I know that I'm going to be 100% in on this, and I'm going to play it until I finish it. Um, love the first one. I like the novel that came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, that was a really good read. And, uh, of course, they got a lot of screen time at uh, Star Wars Celebration this year. I, mm-hmm. I got I to think that they're going to bring him into the live action stuff before long. You don't, yeah, cast, I mean, you don't cast a real actor who looks exactly like the character not to do it. It's I mean, it's got to happen, right? I mean, it seems like, well, what's uh, I mean, so. What shows are running that are in between that are during this time period besides Obi-Wan? None. The Bad Batch. Yeah. He could show up in Bad Batch. Um, I don't think that he will, but he could yeah. um, yeah. because they've done time skips in that show. I, I do think it's not completely out of the question because it'll take a, it'll take several years to do a third game, and we've all but got a third game confirmed to close out the trilogy. Um, I believe can't that. do Star Wars without a trilogy, guys. Well, I believe Respawn has said that it's their intent to do that anyway. So, I mean, that would be years off. You could easily yeah. get a six episode series together uh, for Cal. Yeah, I know. I was just, I was just, I would be, up. I'd be completely down for that. I think that would be really cool. Um, Especially with how they're embracing the expanded universe again. I mean, at the very least, give me a graphic novel with him as the star. Yeah. Um, there's there's a lot of things you can do with him. But Tears of the Kingdom, man. That's I think that's the I think that's the big the biggest highlight for both you and I. As much as we like Star Wars, I think that's the big highlight here. Yeah, I mean for I mean for me, Star Wars is up there, but for me it's Zelda. Yeah. I mean, it's uh I mean, especially because, you know, being part of a Nintendo podcast for eight years, it's like Breath of the Wild was like the first game that really like, quote unquote, put our show on the map, I guess, Uh, just because we I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, Josh, starting a Nintendo podcast during uh, the downslope of the Wii U was not exactly the smartest idea I ever had. No, but, uh, you know, (laughs) you live and you learn. Uh, But I mean, Breath of the Wild means so much 
to both of us, I think, more than just in terms of gaming, but I mean, in life in general, right? Like where we were and for me, how we I mean, and what we were doing, you know. I mean, it's it got me to buy my first Nintendo console since the original Wii came out, mm-hmm. um, which I did not use much. It was the most into Nintendo I'd been since the GameCube era. Um, I've spoken at length about like I love I love Halo, but I simply wouldn't be a gamer without the Legend of Zelda, and it, mm-hmm. I mean Breath of the Wild is pound for pound in my opinion the greatest game of all time yeah it's, um, it's pretty good i've got i've got two zelda games in my top five for anybody who doesn't know me uh really well and it's breath of the wild and the wind waker both of which like had an enormous impact on me at different points in my life mm-hmm. um yeah you you said something before we got started that the new trailer that came out today it's very story driven and you really really enjoyed uh, that it seems like it's the most narrative driven Zelda that we've gotten. It and... seems that way, which is crazy to put that on top of all of like the new features and abilities and stuff too, right? I mean, I think understandably that was that and the dungeon that the dungeons and the uh, weapons breaking seem to be the three major complaints about Breath of the Wild. And either you embraced those changes or you really hated all of them. And for, well, for my money, I would have preferred dungeons, but mm-hmm. I didn't mind the narrative structure of that game, and I sure didn't mind the weapons breaking. Yeah, I mean, my thing was my thing is with with uh, weapon durability. I would have liked some sort of way to uh, fix them. You know, yeah. maybe yeah, not like maybe not like a like a tree branch or anything, but like mm-hmm. you know, like a like a. Like when you would roam the castle and find royal swords or something that had well, like, like the, gu- the guardian weapons that you craft. Yeah, that too, right? Like, just yeah. give me a way to be able to like, you know, fix them or give them better durability or something, right? And uh, it seems like they're t- trying different ways of doing that in this game, not necessarily with crafting, but you know, mm-hmm. uh, through other mechanics in the game. I don't want to go through too much because I know you're kind of trying to do the whole media blackout until I, i'm just thing, but... i just really am like about the story i didn't really watch the last mm-hmm. trailer they gave us and i definitely didn't watch today's dude today's um, today's was like i was like like i was excited for tears of the kingdom because it's a sequel to breath of the wild right but like in the last two trailers like i was like okay those they're cool but this is just like more of the same right or like oh new ability which great. more of the same is like the it's like the best problem you can have i think with right. a series like this right but today's trailer today's trailer got me to the hype level of <laughs> when breath of the wild was like first shown off and how excited everybody was when they found out all the cool things right like this is yeah. i'm as excited now as i expected to be when tears of the kingdom was announced this this game, like from what I've been seeing, very much looks like they spent the last six years watching everybody make these ridiculous YouTube compilations of things you can do in this game. I still see clips occasionally show up of things that I didn't know you could do in this game uh-huh. and or things that I wouldn't have even thought to do. Like, oh, it took me hours to set up this trick shot and things like that. And... It's basically like they saw that and said, what if we just made a game based around how insane you can be? Mm-hmm. Uh, this game looks absolutely batshit in the best way. And I think that for anybody hoping that, uh, oh, may- maybe after Tears of the Kingdom we'll be done with this kind of Zelda, I don't think you're ever going back. Dude, Breath of the Wild is the best-selling Zelda of all time by a long shot. You by really a gonna... very, very large margin. Like Zelda is popular, don't get me wrong, but like, up until the Switch, if you were a Nintendo franchise and you did not have Mario somewhere in your name, mm-hmm. you probably weren't. I mean, and this sounds ridiculous because like this is these are still good sales numbers. You probably were going to really struggle to cross like that eight to ten million threshold. Mm-hmm. And Zelda, I think, had done it approximately once. Oh, excuse me, Mario and Pokemon. Mario and Pokemon are like your guaranteed ones that will cross that every single time. Yeah. Breath of the Wild is still selling. It's like the fourth or fifth best-selling Switch game. Yeah. There were more copies of this game sold than there were Switches on launch day. And that is that is not an exaggeration. That is a real bonafide thing that happened. Mm-hmm. Our friend Ray Apollo bought a Switch <laughs> and his copy did not come in right away. Amazon delayed it by like a week. So he ended up having to buy it digitally when he didn't want to because he, re- he drove to every single store in town and none of them 
had a Switch copy. They're like, we have Wii U copies. They did not have Switch copies. Yeah. On launch. Here, here, so I just I just looked up some like the entire series uh, numbers and mm-hmm. sales. Let me let me give you this little nugget here, Josh. Hit me. Breath of the Wild has sold 31 million units. The second highest selling Zelda game of mm-hmm. all time is Twilight Princess at 8.6 million copies, including the GameCube, Wii, and Wii U versions. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. And I mean, and that's the thing, like, this is a prestige series. Like, Zelda is, it's not like Metroid where like, oh, you gotta be a gamer to know what this is. It's like, no, you fucking know Zelda. If you have any working knowledge of video games, you've heard the name Zelda before. Mm -hmm. And then the third highest selling Zelda game is Ocarina of Time at 7.6 million. That doesn't surprise me. My Ocarina of Time was an absolute monster in the 90s. Yeah. Um, I mean, still consider... I, it's funny how many Zelda games, like, when you talk to people, everybody has a different favorite game in the series. It's mm-hmm. not like... I feel like it's not like Mario, where, like, most of us congregate around either 64, or at mm-hmm. least our generation congregates around 64 or Galaxy as the best. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. If you I talk, mean, if me, you talk to the older generation, probably Super Mario, uh, Super Mario World uh, probably mm-hmm. comes up, or a Mario Brothers yeah. 3. Yeah, for me, I mean, for me, like in terms of Mario, like it's it's Mario three and Mario sixty four for me. Yeah, um, I I've grown away from sixty four the older I've gotten. I loved it yeah. as a kid, but uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I have the really unorthodox pick of Sunshine, but that's just me. Yeah. Um, but the majority the un- of the fan base, I have, the, un- I have the unorthodox pick of Zelda at Twilight Princess. I know I, nobody you definitely likes have an unorthodox. Pick I there. I love Twilight Princess. I think it's I, the best. Best fucking, traditional 3D Zelda. I fucking hate Twilight Princess. That's fine. I, and a lot I have, of I have, though, right? I have like, genuine. I mean, it's funny. I, I've gone on like this whiplash of Zelda, right? Where like I rode the high of Wind Waker for so long. I loved Wind mm-hmm. Waker. I loved Minish Cap. I played the Oracle games. I played both N64 games. And Twilight Princess was coming out. I was part of a Zelda fan page when I was a kid. I was like 13 posting on Zelda forums. Clearly, I was a kid. And everybody else was an adult. And I was basically like, I was being like, fuck y'all. I love a darker Zelda. I'm here for it. And they're like, you're not going to like it, man. And then it comes out and I've never been more upset about a game. Oh, man. That, that I bought a Wii. So I cool. got a Wii on launch day specifically only to play with Twilight Princess. And oh, dude. I, so here's the thing I, about oof. Twilight Princess, though. I, I bought a Wii and I bought Twilight Princess with it. And I hated the motion control so much. See, I, th- I, I think that's I think that's why I hate the game so much. I've only but ever played it with the motion controls. I I played the GameCube version on my Wii with a GameCube controller <laughs> with a Wii well, bird. Y- you know, I really need them. I don't like asking for this, but I really, really, really need them to move th- move Twilight Princess to the Switch. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've heard for years that there's supposed to be a Wind Waker Twilight Princess collection. Um, which, if it's anything like Metroid Prime, they're just sitting on it. Nintendo likes to sit oh, on yeah. things. Yeah. Plus, they're I already can't... done. Because I mean, the the hard. I mean, quote unquote, the hard work, like the asset upresing and the and mm-hmm. the asset replacements and the fixing of the missions that were or the you know the missions that were broken or bonked or whatever. Like that's all done. They just need to like have the engineers port it over, right? And yeah. Uh, by the way, another sad fact, Josh. Another sad fact. Wind Waker. Wind Waker across GameCube and Wii U has only has sold less than six million copies, yeah. which is a travesty. Wind Waker was not received well. Um, that's one of my earliest gaming industry memories. Is I remember seeing the Space World demo for mm-hmm. what Zelda was supposed to look like on GameCube and being blown away. It was a very it, at the time it was like called hyper realistic. I remember remember that when like GameCube like prototype graphics were like this incredible thing that we'd never oh, seen yeah. before. Yeah, it was uh, back when space Space World was a fucking thing. Some of our listeners are probably yeah. too young to know what Space World is. Space World um, was Nintendo's uh, gaming conference. Everybody, kind of like Space World Nintendo's was PSX E3. before PSX. Yeah. Oh man, and they and they showed they that's where they showed uh, Rogue uh, Squadron Two for the first time. Also, so that trailer comes out, everybody went nuts. That's one of the earliest things I remember on gaming forums. Is everyone just went a- absolutely ape shit when IGN posted this video for the first time. Mm-hmm. And so. I, I spent ye- I spent a year reading about this, and then they re-revealed 
Zelda as uh, we didn't know it was Wind Waker at the time, but they re-revealed it with the cell shaded graphics, and everybody lost their minds. It was like this is going to be awful. This looks Zelda terrible. was was the Zelda, name yeah. Zelda was an insult that came out, and I still think that might be the best looking GameCube game. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think that that and game it was so I th- unique. Yeah, I mean, I was one of those people who was kind of upset at the art style too. I'm not going to lie to you, but like yeah. once you play the game and realize like. Oh, this is a this is a great Zelda game, and you know it was kind of like the first kind of it was kind of open right with the sailing and stuff, and I mean that ten year old ten year old Josh thought that this was the greatest thing ever made. Yeah, and that final battle with Ganon. Oh, with (laughs) Fat Ganon. Yeah, yeah. Man, I still I I have a uh, Wind Waker Ganon. I have a little World of Nintendo. Uh, animated Ganondorf figure sitting around here somewhere. I think it's uh, on a shelf in the other room. But yeah, I, I unashamedly love that game. It gave it was the first game that really, like outside of Twilight Princess, gave Zelda a personality. Because mm-hmm. um, you know, of course, you know the, the pirate Tetra and things like that. But like the the Hyrule Royal family, like for the first mm-hmm. time in a 3D family, yeah, or th- 3D family in a 3D game. Um, the going to Hyrule Castle for the first time in that game is, I think, one of the greatest moments in the entire series. Mm-hmm. Uh, seeing the stained glass windows and just like, God, the prologue to that game, the opening of it, like that's that's what I wanted so much, and that's why I think that's part of why I'm so attracted to Breath of the Wild. Like the cell shaded graphics were such a big deal that they've still continued to use those in various regards in e- every one of the 3D Zeldas after, because it's such a distinct hallmark of the series now and like toon link as he was known has Uh become like kind of the symbol for every handheld zelda since Mm -hmm. so it's really cool so we zelda's really special to both of us what i think when i said like i think that you're never going back from breath of wild number one it's the sales but two well they doubled down on the voice acting I know, dude. They got. They, I mean, they. They got I mean, Matt pretty, Mercer. Matt Mercer yeah. is fucking Ganondorf. I know, and I mean, there's, there's three different voices in this trailer that was shown off today. So, <laughs> it's 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 wild. And like, I remember when we heard that they were going to do voice acting for Breath of the Wild, and I was understandably, I was a little scared. I was like, I don't know how I feel about giving a voice to Link after all these years, especially because like the last major franchise they gave voice acting to was Metroid, and like for other M, right? And it yeah. was like not wonderful. Uh like universally considered the worst in the franchise. Yes. Yeah. I I'm a little skeptical. I do wonder if because correct me if I'm wrong, Link does not speak in Breath of the Wild. He doesn't he doesn't speak in any game. Right, but I'm I'm saying like they did voice acting in Breath of the Wild and we still Link did not talk. I uh-huh. wonder if they break it in this game. Hmm. I don't hmm. I don't know. I doubt it. I think we're coming. I think we're coming up on the point where I listen. I love a good silent protagonist. I played the mm-hmm. fuck out of Persona, guys. Okay, I like a good silent protagonist. Mm-hmm. But I think we're getting to a point where eventually you're gonna have to have Link speak, even if it's just like, like in Persona, like your character doesn't, the main character doesn't speak mm-hmm. v- very seldom. There's a few phrases they'll say, or like in a very important cutscene, they'll say a word or something like a single word. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm on the I'm on the fence of like I don't really care if Link talks or not. Like I, I think that more. there are there are some that are like so entrenched in this. If you touch this, you're taking away something sacred from me. Yeah. And I think that's a little silly over a uh, a video game character. Yeah. But it's almost like Link not talking almost falls into the same category as Master Chief should never take his helmet off in a game. Yeah. Uh side tangent speaking of master chief i watched and finished the halo show <laughs> i'm sorry i I've still like never i've never i've never started it i've never watched it i thought it was fine i mean it's not the greatest tv show i've ever watched but the action was fun and while, while we're talking zelda like i have a, I have a final thought about i have a final thought about zelda so bear with me here i went and saw the super mario brothers movie yesterday yeah and afterwards all i could think about was one i really 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 want a Legend of Zelda anime series. I don't want a movie. I want an mm-hmm. anime. Mm-hmm. Um, and which I mean, you would have to let Link would have to talk at that point. 
Well, um, my th- my theory on a Zelda show would be it would be about Zelda and the royal family, and Link wouldn't show up until the very end. That would be ballsy. That would that's my theory on on a Zelda show if they ever did one because like I don't know if you can I, and yes Link would have to talk if he was the main protagonist but what if Zelda was the main protagonist and like so the I mean I, we're characters. we're we are clearly getting to a point where Zelda is going to be playable in one of these games mm-hmm. it's the next um, one it's the third game in this trilogy I I really hope so but uh, you know you you have the con you have the eternal conflict between you know uh, or you know triangle the Triforce if you will between mm-hmm. Link Zelda Ganondorf. Um, my theory it, in this game actually was like, it's, I don't know if they're going to play with time travel or dimensions or something, but Link and Zelda are connected and like, you would have to like swap between them in these dimensions to solve different puzzles. I don't know if the switch can even handle that, but I mean, that that's been a theory for a while now that you were going to switch between the two, but I like your yeah. idea. I haven't heard the dimensions one. I, I would like that. Again, you know, I've seen, I've watched very long. I watched the reveal trailer and I was like, yep, I'm in. I spent a hundred something hours in the first game. I'm here. Um, My hour count is 241 right now. If you, if you were to do an anime, I would love to see the studio behind Attack on Titan do it. Um, And here's the only reason that I, because I, I know that people could be like, well, Josh, what about the studio to this Demon Slayer? What about Ufotable? No, they already do Demon Slayer. I've already got them doing one like hack and slash anime. I need Ufotable, or as uh, Ray and I call them, Ugotable, to do Metroid. That's what I want to see them do. I want to see them tackle a science fiction property. I would love to see the Attack on Titan studio, though. Um, or um, I think the same studio does both uh, Attack on Titan and G2 2 Kaisen. I think MAPPA does both. I would love to see them tackle The Legend of Zelda. I think they could do it really special. I think you get really good storytelling out of it. Good voice acting, of course. Beautiful animation. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to see that. I think that the easiest starting place to do a Zelda series, if you were to do a anime and you were to... because that So that's the thing. is like, do you adapt an existing story? And I think with Zelda, it's way easier to adapt an existing story than it is with something like Mario. Because Zelda has pretty heavy plot and like storytelling. I would say that you probably would do Ocarina of Time. I mean, I think that that's just like the easy choice and that lets, yeah. you know, Zelda obviously be a total badass as Sheik. Yeah. Um I yeah, would sus- That's probably where you start, right? And then I would suspect could... that uh cuz I mean, you would do it as an anthology series, right? Mhm. Yeah, I mean, you would have to. Your your first two seasons, obviously, you have the same link at you know with Ocarina of Time. Maybe you decide to do Majora's Mask. Um, I think after that, you could do. Uh, you could probably adapt Link's Awakening. Um, but I don't. I don't know how that would translate to a series. I probably you would go to Twilight Princess, honestly. You you know, it'd be cool is if you got a different studio to do a different version of each game. I would like that. I think it would be really tricky um, just with yeah. how overworked some of these studios are. Um, oh, yeah. I'm 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 just saying that would be the cool uh, the, the, the pipeline dream. Yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, think you probably go impossible. Ocarina, Majora's Twilight Princess. I think you actually skip Skyward Sword. I think you skip Skyward Sword initially. I think you do those three and then I think you go straight to Wind Waker. Because that yeah. kind of like closes out that section of the timeline. Mm-hmm. And then you could pose it as like in the very far future, you know, Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Um, Breath of the Wild and uh, Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom. And then like, oh, well, let's let's do a flashback to the world in the clouds. Like, how did how did all this shit start? How did everybody come to live in Hyrule? Here you go. There, There's a lot of things you could do. Zelda is just such like a rich world for all of that and that that's all i could think coming out of the mario movie was like damn i would really love to see a 2d animated legend of zelda series that is not the philip cdi things Mm -hmm. that is not just an abomination (laughs) i'd really love to see this i I think you could do some really cool stuff um just obviously an amazing cast of side characters if it gets me prince side on into a game into a series i'm all for it He's uh absolutely one of my favorite. I was vi- one of the few stills I saw from the day was uh, he is very prominently in one of the shots, and I was just like, yes, 
my man returns. I was afraid he wasn't going to be there. He's here front and center. I'm mm-hmm. ready. Yeah, there's a lot of cool looking characters in this in this game, new and old. Um, yeah. I there's a lot I mean, not to like spoil it. There's a lot of Twilight Princess in this trailer and it made me so happy. So, one thing I did, I saw a tweet about this and I I just want I just want you to I just want to know if you caught it also. That uh people were saying that they heard a little bit of Midna's melody in the music. Mm-hmm. It's in there. It's in there. Oh boy. Dude, as oh somebody boy. who as somebody who played Twilight Princess like six times all the way through in various ways, and uh Minna being like one of my favorite characters from the series, it's it's it, there's Twilight Princess all over this game. And which makes me feel which makes me think that there's some sort of interdimensional play instead of because my original theory was like, oh well there there's probably gonna be like time travel, right? I mean I feel like there's some sort of time element, but hearing that, especially today made me feel like there's going to be some sort of dimensional play in this game. And yeah, it has me even and like, there's like the little chimes, like when the music's playing and it, it like skips, a, like skips, like the music is skipping and you hear like the sound that the mirror makes. It's like, oh man, it's, there's so much Twilight Princess in here. And there's also this character in there that nobody knows who it is. And, uh, it's not it's not Midna, but I feel like it's someone from the other realm, and it made me really excited too. Bro, so there are a few things that would make me lose my shit. As much as I like complain about Twilight Princess, I think the final boss fight is a little absurd, but I also really liked Ganon. Um Which Ganon one? The uh, pup, puppet princess, the pig Ganon, or just Ganon and Ganondorf in general? Ganondorf in general. Okay. Um I actually really like. I love that Zant was a puppet the whole time, and I think that's such. A, I think he's such a fascinating character mm-hmm. that you could there's do a, more with him. That's the thing too is like there's a lot of imagery in here that reminds me of like the statues from the Twilight Realm and like his helmet, his weird like tongue helmet thing. It's not exactly in there, but there's a lot of statues and imagery that reminds me of that in here. Hmm. So. Well, we we will see, man. Uh, God. Welcome to Zelda Cast, everybody. <laughs> welcome to Zelda. Yeah, welcome to Zelda Cast. We did this with uh, Mass Effect last year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens when Bungie doesn't give us content. Uh, <laughs> high rule, high rule, high rule casuals is what we are right now. I mean, I will, I will be talking a lot about Diablo when Diablo comes out. Also, that's that's the other one yeah. I wanted to talk about very quickly. Yes, um, please do, because like I've never really been a big Diablo person, but I know a lot of people are excited for Diablo. So 4, I think, I, I think Diablo really cool. four is such a big deal because it definitely leans. I mean, obviously, it's it's an it's an ARPG um, mm-hmm. like traditional Diablos, but it's completely open world and it's very much geared towards RPG fans. I think it, it is the most accessible one, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they lay everything out very easily when you're uh, picking your character at the beginning. They let you know what the abilities are going to be, how to control, etc. And the biggest change for me from 3 to 4 is that 4 was built with um, controllers in mind. So mm-hmm. much so to the point that the uh, game director uh, straight up said on the uh, live stream they were doing during beta weekend that uh, not only is it built from the ground up for a controller, but that is the only way that he personally plays the game is with a game pad. Mm-hmm. That made me feel a lot better in my decision to be playing it like that. I don't, I don't like playing with mouse and keyboard, nor do I have a PC anyways. Um, but that was my biggest hang up with Diablo three. I think was, I just didn't like how it could, how it played on a controller. Granted, mm-hmm. I tried playing it on 360. I'm sure it's much better on Xbox one, but this i think this is so easy even if you've never played a diablo game it's so easy to just jump in and play like obviously it's more rewarding if you played previous diablos Uh but they still fill they still fill you in the game is just so rich in lore and story and you know world events are there and like i'm I'm exploring the area in the uh, alpha and i'm like or in the band i'm like oh my god this is a huge area and you look at the map and it's not a big area at all it's a very small part of the map and that makes me excited. Like, we're finally away from Tristam, uh, which is the setting of Diablo 1 and 2. You go back there in 3. Very, very, very happy that we're not dealing with that. At least as of right now, we're not going there. So it, it's just a very special game, I think. Um, I can't wait to play it with a group. 
Uh, I played it with I played it with one friend. I played it with our friend, with our friend Ray, um, and uh, I was running a necromancer. He was running a druid. I want to say he was playing a druid. At, he played a druid for part of it, and he played a uh, sorcerer for the other part. So we were having a lot of fun just running through and uh, playing the game. I can see myself playing maybe like two, three runs on different characters um, before putting it down. But this is this is probably going to be the game of the summer for me. It's going to be this and Zelda that I'm going to be working my way through because Zelda is almost certainly getting DLC. Um, whereas Diablo won't get an expansion for like a year and a half, two years probably. You think you think Zelda's gonna get DLC? Yes. I'm, I'm like like I know the yes. last one did, but I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure if I'm I feel absolute, like they would have announced it already. I'm a hundred percent certain that it's gonna get an expansion pass. Hundred percent. I mean I'm not gonna complain if it does. I'm just I don't I, I feel like I'm, they should have announced something already. I think Nintendo has figured out well, I mean, if it's gonna be story content, they might not wanna like even tease it until yeah, after the game is out. It's fair. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> um because I mean there's Obvious, I mean, <laughs> I love that we're getting back to Zelda. There's the, and I don't know, you you know much more about Nintendo than I do. There's, I know it's at least a theory that's been floating around for a long time that Tears of the Kingdom started out as DLC for Breath of the Wild. Yeah, they've okay. they've come out and, they've come out and said it. Okay, okay, yeah. Like, like I said, I have pretty much like gone full mm-hmm. full blackout at this point. Yeah, they've said as much, and then they said there there was okay. too much we wanted to do, and we just expanded it into a full game, that's and fair. like a lot a lot of theories is that skyward sword is actually the first game in the series um which yes i'm like i don't i don't like that because i don't really care for skyward sword at all but like it totally makes sense with the addition obviously the addition of yeah. the sky stuff but yeah oh my god dude i could do an entire podcast on the uh timeline of zelda lore oh god uh, ocarina of time fucked everything up that's all you need to know yeah. No. You know what? You know what? You know what fucked it up was when they actually published the timeline in in the uh, in the book, and then they were like, eh, "Maybe not. I don't know." Yeah. The like I said, I was part of a Zelda fan forum when I was a kid, and uh, that was a hotly debated topic was the uh, the timeline because that was leading up to Twilight Princess coming out, mm-hmm. and uh, everyone was like totally convinced, like, "Oh, Twilight Princess has to be like." You know, it has to be the same link from Ocarina of Time and this and that. And then like, oh, it's not. But it's not that long after Ocarina. Like, it was just, it's it was very weird. And then we were like, oh, wait. But it's in like a certain part of the timeline. And mm-hmm. there's just, there's all sorts of shit. That is the most confusing timeline. It's the most pointless thing to argue about. Because it doesn't fucking matter. No. And it's like, well, Breath of the Wild has to be like either super early or super, 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 super far into the future. Yeah, like, those are I- your only two options. I mean, I'm pretty sure they confirmed that it's like pretty far off in the future. Where, I like, believe so. Also, so, I mean, like the technology alone. Yeah, like so far, so that like it doesn't matter which timeline you follow because it's just so yeah. far. I Breath of the Wild, in a lot of ways, kind of feels like it was the reboot the franchise had needed for a long time. Mm-hmm. They wanted Skyward Sword to be. It feels like Skyward Sword was supposed to be that, and mm-hmm. it just didn't click with most of us. Yeah. It's better on Switch, I have to say. I so. bought it and I still haven't played it. It's the only 3D Zelda I've never played and beaten. Yeah, I mean, it's I don't know. It's one of only two Zeldas controls. I've one of only two Zeldas I've never played and beaten. The other one being Link Between Worlds because I never owned a 3DS. Yeah, it, which I still think is the next 2D Zelda coming to Switch, a port of that Link Between Worlds. I hope mm-hmm. so because I've never gotten to play it. So. I would love if, because I think Metroid Dread has shown that it can be successful. Um, mm-hmm. If Metroid Dread can be the best-selling Metroid game of all time mm-hmm. on the Switch, then a 2D Zelda would do absolutely bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. and Link's, the I'd, Link's I'd love a sequel remake. to Minish Cap. Mm. Yeah. The Link's Awakening remake was really good. It was, it was good. Uh, it's not the exact kind of game that I would want, but it was good. No. No, it's it's incredibly faithful to the stupid obtuse '90s puzzles, right? Like it's just to a fault. Yeah, to a fault. Tunic, Tunic was a better Link's Awakening. Changed my mind. I didn't play Tunic, so uh, Tunic is I, as an old school well, uh, like Link to the Past and the Link's Awakening mm-hmm. fan. It's it's so the thing about Tunic is I play I played Death's Door. Yes, and then right after that. I started Tunic. I'm like, these games look too similar and don't feel enough. It, it's the it, it was the Horizon Breath of the Wild problem where like 
I need a palate cleanser before I go back to tunic because I feel I my my dexterity is attuned to a uh, death door and this game is very slow. And so I need a I need a like a cleanser. T- Tunic is a game that th- definitely does not hold your hand at all, and uh, it feels like it feels like the Zelda's of old, which yeah. I really enjoy. It's very much an homage. Yeah, the manual but, uh, system is cool too, though. Corey, yeah, we've got a lot of questions tonight. We do. Also, before we get to questions, I just want to before we get I to questions, say, I just want to just quick quick sentence. Final Fantasy sixteen oh, looks yes. rad. Looks rad final fantasy 16 looks awesome i deliberately did not watch today's state of play because i don't want to see anything else from it at this there's point there's so many spoilers in there i would not watch it i wasn't going to play final fantasy 16 when it first came out the last time that they showed footage like a month month and a half ago that's mm-hmm. what sold me the february the february state of play is what sold me yeah it looks, I wasn't. It looks awesome. I was gonna. I was gonna wait a little bit because I was gonna be like, ah, I'm gonna be so deep in Diablo and uh, coming out of Zelda. I don't know if I want to play Final Fantasy 16. Final Fantasy 16 is my July game at this point. I've already decided. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I look forward to playing that a lot before uh, Baldur's Gate and Starfield take over the rest of my year. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, Corey. Let's let's get to these questions. Ooh. We got a lot. We let's got a do lot. it. We 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 have a lot. Um. Who oh boy. Uh, Andre writes in and asks, Andre, with the, with the many changes coming next season, what's one you're absolutely thrilled about? I don't see any way that you can get out of here without answering, but being able to put deep sight on any weapon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That has mm-hmm. to be it. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, especially because they haven't really added a way for us to get the red borders we missed from last year yet. And I'm really annoyed that I'm still missing a few Leviathan ones. Yeah. Um, by contra also I'm having I'm really riding the struggle bus on the Neomuna red borders yeah about that um what's going on with that Josh um I mean I'm of the opinion that they need to make uh Nimbus also into a weapon vendor and let me just buy a, a guaranteed red border each week I don't know why that wouldn't be a thing but they drop so sparingly out there that it's insane uh, the people who were able to craft the who were able to craft the pulse in like the first week or so, hats off to you, man. Like I get that if you run the campaign on all three characters, that's three guaranteed red borders, but that still sounds torturous because mm-hmm. you still have to get the last two, and there's really only one guaranteed way to get them, and that's doing the gold patrols and then hoping the gold patrol drops you one. That's yeah. just why it helps that most of those weapons aren't like amazing. Yeah. Um. I mean, obviously, outside of uh, Filecastic Spiral is awesome. Uh, that's the the Arc Pulse, by the way. Um, very good weapon in both PvE and PvP. I was running a Volt Shot uh, roll of it that I got, and I love it. I just wish that I could get it as a Red Border. Mm. Um, I think that the activity that you can spawn into, the uh, Terminal Overloads, I think that your first Terminal Overload of the day, the week, whatever, should give you a guaranteed Red Border also. Um, I'm having a significantly harder time getting red borders here than I ever did on the throne world. And that's with the yeah. wellspring weapons taken into account. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, uh, thankfully agree. they saw through their problem last year and did not make uh, crafting all the weapons required for the title this time. Yeah. Good job. Good change. Good, change. good change. Do you do you have any other uh, a- any anything different that you're really looking forward no, to next season? No, of course, of course not. I'm no. That's the that's the only thing that <laughs> of matters. Of course not. Your face was so priceless there. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no um, I uh, before we before we move on to the yeah, yeah. the next question. By the way, shout out, shout out to. Uh, Everybody who who took me through Root of Nightmares last weekend, shout out! No exotic though, Fox. You disappointed me. What uh, what you what you think of the raid? It was it was good. I mean it it it's really easy. <laughs> uh, I mean it, it, compared to the other raids, it's pretty. It's it's not entirely difficult. Although I did run it with everybody who had run it before, and they explained it to me, and so you know it's that made it a lot easier. But uh. I feel like this is if you've never raided before, it kind of feels like Deepstone Crypt in a way where it's like a kind of a good entry to a raid. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I I like the room with all the planets in it. That room is amazing looking. Uh, And uh, but yeah, I mean, it was it was fun. I definitely want to run it again. Uh, It's not my favorite raid, but it's not the worst raid they've ever done. Yeah, I, that's kind of how I feel. I think it's a perfect starter raid. I just don't know if this was the time to bring in a starter raid. Yeah, yeah, that, um, that was the that's that's where I was kind of confused too. Is like that, that was and that was part of the discussion that Dealer and I had um, mm-hmm. on our raid review. Um, mm-hmm. So, next question is from Joasis. Are there any plans for a uh, Tower Casuals Patreon? Uh, no, 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 um, not right now. Yeah, <laughs> it, we, it, is, I mean, it is hard enough for us to be able to do one show a week. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we've, we've tossed around the idea, but like, you know, Josh has a million things going on and, you know, I have my other stuff going on and like, yeah, this is this. Corey is an extremely busy man. I don't know if you guys know this. Yeah. Um, for those unaware, I actually run an entire podcast network, uh, other than this show and it's a lot of work and a lot of, uh, managing spreadsheets and, people and uh (laughs) contacts and uh it's it would if look if if this was the only show i was doing then yes probably we would talk about it but like you know between josh's schedule and my schedule this it would be impossible to offer any offer you guys anything other than like hey here's the show (laughs) you know so yeah it, it would be it would be unfair and i think part of that we we open the store partly to like offer you guys some things, but also like we've already kind of committed that money to charity and other things. Like unless one of us desperately needs something that we absolutely need, like a microphone or a headset or something, which I don't believe either of us really do. Like no, all that money that goes to charities and uh, the Bungie foundation. And obviously lately the, the Lance Reddick uh, mom's care foundation right now. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, just to kind of explain why we're not doing one. Uh, our next question comes to us from Knox. Uh, Knox asks, what are the big Knox. chase weapons this season? I'm finding myself strapped for time and need to prioritize what I'm getting. So for, first off, Knox, I would say you still have a solid like six weeks at the time of this recording, at least until the next season starts. And as a reminder, all the stuff from this season will be obtainable all year long. It's all yeah. obtain- it's obtainable for the whole year up until the final shape comes out. So I would say don't stress too much, and like obviously metas can change between now and then. Right yeah. now, of the six season, and if we're just thinking about the stuff you can get at the war table, that's all I'm considering. I'm not taking into account uh, Niamuna weapons, raid weapons, no, Iron Banner, none of that. If we're just talking about this season, what you need to be getting, um, my only two, like, well, I have three. I don't remember what class you play on Nox, but if you play it as a Titan, you absolutely need to get the uh, Throne Cleaver sword and craft it. That is absolutely a must-have for Titans. It's the best sword in the entire game. Um, I would say Royal Executioner, the uh, Solar Fusion Rifle, is very, very good. Uh, if you can get the right rolls on it. I believe you can get incandescent on it, if I remember correctly. <laughs> but you can get firmly planted an offhand strike, which is great. Um, really, really, really like uh, Royal Executioner the more I use it. Um, especially with the uh, the buff to rapid frames. Uh, that thing's going to be an absolute monster. And then uh, I would say the other Leviathan weapon that is in the uh, Sword Ingram, uh, which is uh, the Imperial Decree Primary Shoddy. Uh, I loved it when it came out the first time, and I really like it again. I am very excited to go craft this shotgun. I need one more frame, and then I can craft it. Um, nice. With the overabundance of the Engrams that drop, there is no reason for everybody to not have these weapons, at least have the blueprints for them to be able to craft them when you so desire uh, by the end of the year. Because if they're dropping this many now, let's, let's say like they hypothetically continue dropping when you do playlist activities throughout the year like you're gonna have so many engrams stored up there i'm actually afraid to think of how many but this is also like probably the most efficient way to get like quick legendary shards now too so keep that in mind um i i know some people really like uh the the regnant uh heavy grenade launcher i am a fan if you can craft it because you can do it with the we can do it with explosive light um 
and I think that it is the be- best heavy grenade launcher in the game right now. Uh, not really saying a whole lot, but I think it's the best one in the game. Um, <laughs> Wendigo who is my response. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. And then I I know a good number of people who like the Strand Auto Rifle, uh, Perpetualis. Uh, I personally don't really care for this that much. I know that you can get some really cool rolls on it. Um, it has ha- it has hatchling. You can get target hatchling. You can get target lock. You can get golden tricorn. Um, I'm not super uh, like in on this simply because we got another strand auto rifle in the raid, which is far and away better than this. Yeah, Rufus's Fury <clears throat> might be the best auto rifle in the game right now. Yeah, it's pretty good. I got it. I didn't so, get a good roll on it, but I, I got it. I Corey, I'm one pattern away from crafting this. If I can get in and run this week, I can craft it, and I'm so excited. I will never take it off. I have been running that in every activity that I can justify it in right now. So really, really digging it. Um, but yeah, the, no, I, I think that uh, currently like weapons are kind of a bummer um, in terms of ones that have come out. Um, I get, I mean, I guess if you're asking for uh, any other suggestion, um, like when you, you talk about being strapped for time knocks, um, I don't think you should worry at all about seasonal stuff. Um, yeah. But I want to do a quick rundown of things that are going to disappear next season. We we talked about this last week, but uh, weapons that will be leaving include uh, Mindbender's Ambition and Malicious Birthright from Nightfalls, Inquisitor and Whistler's Whim uh, from Trials, Wise and Rebuke and Hero's Burden from Iron Banner, and then Rose from the Comp Playlist. I would say of these, Mindbender's is a good shotgun. Mindbender's and Malicious are both good, but I think that, especially in the case of Malicious Birthright, I think there are better uh kinetic breach lo- or better just breach loaders in general at this point um malicious birth was really special when it came out because it did things that other ones did not do mind menders it was a monster then it's a monster now your last chance to get each of these respectfully is uh the week of the uh of april 18th and then the week of uh may 2nd so mind menders week of the 18th malicious birthright week of the second and, or you can focus them at any time at zavala um trials of osiris uh, I think there's so many better bows than Whistler's Whim and uh, Inquisitor. There are better, uh, there's better arc slug shotties. There's literally a better one called Ganora's Axe at Saladin. Mm-hmm. Um, Iron Banner, I mean, Wise and Rebuke. Yeah, you, you can get some spicy rolls on that. Hero's Burden. Uh, this is one I wanted to bring up because I know a lot of people in the Discord are grinding for this. Trying to get it with, uh, I think it was uh, Destabilizing Rounds. Um... I personally have not gotten a roll with that. I will be trying to chase that on the last Iron Banner week of the season. Uh, in for- I love Fortress, so I'll be playing a lot of Fortress trying to get it. See if I can get one of those rolls to drop or not. I have like 40 Ingram stored up, I think. Um, see if I can get one to drop and then, you know, Ro- Rose Rose will at least be back. So not too worried about it. Uh, but those are, those are the weapons that are leaving. Um, you might want to think about those. Uh, Inquisitor will be in rotation. Um, the... Uh, weekend of uh may then or the week of may the 9th uh for trials that'll be the last time you have a chance to get an adept inquisitor if you wanted one whistler's whim is already out of the rotation and the last iron banner uh is the week of uh april 25th so not this coming week but the week after i feel like iron banner is just popping up all the time like it, it's it's how it had it, it's how it fell with um yeah the change they had to make but yeah i totally agree that's three iron <laughs> banners in like six weeks that's yeah. it's a little too Which, much for me. I'm what I'm okay with. I like Iron Banner, but I yeah. also don't play a lot of PvP. So um, I think having trials from week one next season is gonna help that feeling too. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. So we're not sitting for like three weeks without a pinnacle PvP experience. Yeah. Uh so very excited about that. Uh let me get yeah. these questions pulled back up for us. Uh <laughs> We joked about uh, cancel Corey earlier, but uh, Saint yeah. <laughs> Saint fourteen jokingly asked us uh, as the cancel Corey movement has started. Uh, who's who replacing him down the road? Nobody. Corey and I uh, agreed long ago that we were not doing this show without the other. Uh, yeah. Who would you like to do a pod with, though? I think this is a fun question. Oh, um, I'm going to choose to interpret this as anybody from uh, Bungie or from the Destiny community. Yeah. So. I mean, I've actually reached out to uh, Guardians Mental Health, uh, which is someone that, yes. you know, uh, Joe specifically from there um, 
to come on and kind of talk some destiny and kind of what they're doing obviously uh with that because i think that's an incredible uh thing that they're doing Um, Mm -hmm. they're they're you know prepping for some stuff but within the next six to eight weeks i would say that they'll be on at some point to to hang out and talk to us and uh i really wanted to have them on because i know a lot of people suffer from mental health uh in different ways and what they're doing is super important um so yeah i would love to i would love to have them on uh at some point uh so what what about you josh uh my name is bife bife uh absolutely bife or uh mylan is somebody i would love to uh sit down just like pick their brain uh on lore and story stuff um as far as like content creators out there go as far as uh as far as people at bungie um he he's an ex Bungie employee now but uh, i'd love to uh kind of pick damage's brain on what is it like to uh be the community manager for one of the most popular uh games as a service titles Mm -hmm. um and uh just i would love to uh i'd I'd also love to sit down and uh pick kevin yanes's brain uh i know he no longer works on destiny he's still at bungie but uh it's funny like so many people have moved on uh recently that i'd love to sit down and talk to uh previously i I think Corey and I, i don't think we were asked this question explicitly but uh, our dream had been to, uh, if we could have picked any guest from the history of Destiny, was genuinely to get Lance Reddick. Yeah, and there was one point where that actually kind of looked like a possibility. Uh, yeah. But then he signed on to do Resident Evil, and then I never, I never followed up, and now sadly, like this is uh, no longer yeah. can happen. Uh, also, <laughs> fun fact: we were actually supposed to have Liana Rupert on this show it was at one point right when she quit game informer and couldn't tell anybody where she was going we we had like a three-week span where we thought we had it tied up and then we yeah. were like oh shit that yeah. cory cory messaged me he's like well i don't think we're getting liana anymore and i was like why what happened yeah. did one did, did i did i tweet something he was like no check this out i was like oh, god damn it yeah <laughs> we're, so, uh, we're thrilled for you we love you liana but god damn it <laughs> yeah uh yeah, it was like it was like that week, the last couple of weeks she was at Game Informer, and we were like, yeah, "Yeah, that'd be that'd be great to have her on Talk to Destiny." And then like she was like, "Yeah, let me let me see, I have some things going on. I, I will get back with you." And then, uh, you know, we found out she was working at Bungie, and then she was like, "I can't." <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, well, I get it." Yeah, it, to- totally to be to be expected at that point. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, our next question, I believe, comes to us from Ronnie. Um, yes, it does. Uh, this is the non-Destiny question, of course. Um, as both of you love Star Wars, who is your favorite canon character and favorite non-canon or lesser known character? Man, well, they've been bringing a lot of the non-canon characters into canon, like, I don't know, Thrawn. (laughs) I think Thrawn is kind of like, you know, next to Vader, like one of the coolest villains Star Wars has ever made by far. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, he's kind of the gold standard. That original Thrawn trilogy, which is no longer canon, is awesome. It's one of the coolest. <laughs> it's not, I've but ever. it might be soon. Yeah, it, <laughs> in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, it's incredible. I I highly recommend. Even if you are like a Star Wars canon nerd, like please read those. Uh, Tim- uh, Timothy Zahn's an incredible writer. Oh yeah. Yeah, didn't he help do some Rebels stuff and, and other things, right? So Timothy Zahn wrote the Thrawn trilogy in the right. old canon. He wrote a duology that took place uh, 15 years after Return of the Jedi, I believe. He wrote one that took place during the original trilogy, but I don't know if it included mm-hmm. Thrawn. And then he did a uh, prequel novel that actually had uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin in it, uh, briefly. Yeah. Uh, Outbound Flight. I actually have a signed copy of Outbound Flight. I don't think it's in here. Um Oh, it is. It's it's ba- it's back on my shelf. I have a signed copy of Outbound Flight that a friend of mine uh, got signed at a Comic Con for me uh, and personalized from Timothy Zahn. Uh, nice. He did a new Thrawn trilogy uh, as well as consulted on Thrawn's appearance in Rebels. I have to imagine that he's probably an executive producer on the Ahsoka series. Yeah, um, I, 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 I can't. Ima- I can't imagine having Thrawn in live action and not asking Timothy Zahn to consult. Yeah, I wonder. Uh, he's probably he's probably like even 
I, he probably has a heavy hand in this Ahsoka series, right? I'm, I'm, I would, I would have be... to, Im- I would have to imagine that he has at least a part in it. Yeah, I don't know how heavy, but I mean, the Ahsoka series definitely seems like it's setting up to adapt, uh, loosely adapt uh, Heir to the Empire, which is considered by many uh, to be the best Star Wars novel ever. Uh, that's mm-hmm. the first book of the Thrawn trilogy. Um, but man. Uh, we're yeah. we're in for a fucking treat there. I I, w- I would co-sign. I think I think Thrawn's one of the most fascinating characters in the universe. Yeah. Uh, what about a no? What about a non-canon or a lesser known character? Oh man. Uh, so non-canon or lesser known? Man, I don't I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I and mean, pull somebody from the old EU. Yeah, but see, I wasn't really into the old EU. Oh, really. got you. So, got you. um, I mean, man, my son is like really upset. I can hear him very faintly. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you answer while I kind of check on that? I guess. Um. So for me, I think that my favorite character is definitely Han Solo. Um, I loved playing with lightsabers as a kid, but there was just something about Han Solo. He uh, he dressed cooler than everybody else. He had the best spaceship. He his best friend was a Wookiee, and yeah. he had a chess he had a chessboard on his ship. Like it yeah, was just cool. He's the, he's the coolest character in Star Wars. Period. I don't care what anybody really says. He he had the right amount of cocky swagger, and I mean, so much of that is because he's young Harrison Ford, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even even Harrison F- even Harrison Ford in Force Awakens was like kind of right back in it a little. Arguably, bit, right? that's uh, and arguably that's his best turn as the character. Yeah. Um. He, just pheno- phenomenal. Uh, I always loved him and Boba Fett when I was a kid. Uh, yeah. Was a big fan of the expanded universe. Uh, non-canon character. Uh, I mean, I'm going to keep it with the solos. The solo twins. Uh, yeah. Jason and Jaina. Definitely. Um, I love Kylo Ren. Don't get me wrong. But Jason Solo was another character entirely. And his story is actually, I think, infinitely more tragic than uh, Kylo Ren's. Yeah, uh, because Jason willingly makes the decision to go to the dark side because he thinks he's going to save the galaxy in doing it, and in reality, he just becomes corrupted, becomes a tyrant, literally takes over the galaxy, very similar to Kylo Ren, takes over the galaxy, and uh, is killed by his sister in a uh, climatic lightsaber duel when he uh, he stops fighting her to uh, warn uh, his secret wife and his daughter about an assassination attempt through the Force. He reaches through the Force to save them. And uh, his sister delivers the killing blow, not realizing that's what he's doing. He basically becomes himself in his final minutes. Um, I think it's a very tragic story. Her story is great. Uh, of course, she, uh, you know, she's known as the Sword of the Jedi. And uh, right. basically, it's implied that she probably becomes either the Grandmaster or the Co-Grandmaster at one point uh, at the end of the old canon timeline. Yeah. Um, alongside Luke's son, Ben. As for a lesser known character, I fucking love Max Rebo. I fucking love the little blue elephant from Jabba's Palace that plays his little circular keyboard. I was so relieved to find out that he survived the explosion of Jabba's sail barge when he showed up in Book of Boba Fett. I was fucking thrilled. I was like, yes, yes. There are few obscure characters in media that I love as much as Max Rebo. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I, I like, I mean, I like I like Qui Gon Jinn a lot from the prequels. Um, yeah, I feel like he's one of the things that's aged really well from those first two movies. That like, uh-huh. there's not much that's aged well, but he's aged really well. Yeah, <clears throat> also, he was a different kind of Jedi Master than we expected. Yeah, I looking back I, on I, it, I I kind of wish he would have survived for through at least the first two. Man, that prequel trilogy had like an interesting they, <sighs> such a they disaster. Were, there were story beats there that were interesting. And if they would have just take like, man, we could do a whole show on rewriting the prequel trilogies. Oh but, uh, God. Yeah, man. Like Count Dooku was pretty much like you could have just put Darth Maul there and he was way cooler. Like, I, I don't know. There's a lot you could have done, I guess. There was, I there was digress. an awful lot. Yeah. There was an awful lot we could have done there. Um, what do you think? What do you think about, uh, a, uh, uh, Daisy Ridley coming back to play Ray in the new movie. Um, I'm happy you asked me this. I'm a lot more on board with her coming back than I am with some of the other decisions being made. Um, 
So there were whispers about this time last year that uh, there was going to be a movie that was going to explore the new Jedi. I get really triggered when I hear the phrase New Jedi Order because the New Jedi Order is an infamously awful book series Mm -hmm. that had like three cool scenes in it ever. And the rest of the 20 book series was just awful. Chewbacca got crushed by a moon for starters. Um, that was in the very first novel. So seven-year-old me was scarred for life reading his first ever adult book and Chewbacca gets crushed by a planet. Um, probably explains an awful lot about my psyche around Star Wars characters. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, uh, I I remember liking it because it was Luke Skywalker as a grandmaster and I'm excited to see what they do with this. It's 15 years after the rise of Skywalker, which still from despite all my love of Star Wars, I have never rewatched that movie. I've never bought it. it. Is the only Star Wars movie I do not own or have ever watched after my initial viewing in theaters. Uh, so I think it's just a complete disaster. About six months ago, I actually rewatched the sequel trilogy. <laughs> I'm sorry. And well, I was trying to figure out like because I don't know, I just I just went back and rewatched them, and I was like, man, do, are some of these movies as bad as people say they are? And like, I actually really like The Force Awakens a lot. I know it's kind of a retread of A New Hope, but I yeah. think it's... Oh, it's 100% a retread. Yeah. Yeah. N- yeah, but I think they had to do that to be kind of safe. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, agree. I think you want a solid foundation to launch off of, and, and I think it was interesting. I think they introduced a lot of cool things. Uh, the whole, obviously, like, the big thing I wish they would do is give uh, uh, Finn his own kind of redemption series because they just <laughs> over. but like that whole subplot was could have been cool I guess uh, and then like The Last Jedi it's, it's fine but the oh, third man. movie the third movie is like I watched it and I'm like I don't know if there's really a plot here I think there's like a MacGuffin and then they brought back everything people like about star wars like the emperor and space battles and action mm-hmm. scene there's not really like where's the plot you know yeah so uh, with the risk of derailing this show uh um, oh because we I, haven't I, derailed it already i, I have <laughs> i definitely have some serious thoughts about the sequel trilogy i think that Force Awakens has aged really badly. Uh, in it's only been out for eight years, and I think it's aged very poorly. Um, yeah, but do you think said, that's the, that's because of the people's opinions on the other movies, or do you I, think I, it's just because of the movie? No, I, I think it's a little bit of I think it's a little bit of everything. Um, I think definitely people's opinion, polarized opinions on eight and nine, certainly don't help. Uh, part of it is I think just J.J. Abrams. I think J.J. Abrams has suffered a reputation hit that he's probably never going to recover from. So, like, I've no, I've followed JJ for a very long time. I watched Alias when it was on TV. I liked Lost a lot. Lost was the first really message board show that I ever watched. Uh, mm. 2005, man. 2004, 2005. Um, I got really into Fringe. I get really into shows that JJ starts and then he doesn't have anything to do with. He just throws all these ideas at a whiteboard. He opens his mystery box and then he walks away. And JJ <laughs> is great at starting things, but he's terrible at finishing them. And uh, I said the same thing about Star Trek. I thought the the first movie of the Star Trek reboot is great. The second one, not so much. And notice J.J. did not come back for the third one, which was definitely better. I have the same problem with Star Wars. I think The Force Awakens works for what it was intended to do, which is reintroduce the audience to Star Wars after you know the prequels kind of tainted everyone's mouths a little bit. But even by the time seven came out, people were really starting to come around on the prequels. But yeah, okay, George had some kooky ideas, but like especially episode three really is pr- actually pretty good. Episode yeah. three is really good, especially Order 66 is just mm-hmm. like one of the best sequences in any Star Wars movie. The opening space battle is cool. The fight between Anakin and Obi-Wan, Yoda and Sidious. Like there's so many cool things about three. Seven, so Force Awakens works great as the start of a new adventure. It works horribly as a number seven in a nine film saga. Yeah. Um, I, and I've been extremely clear about uh, how I feel about The Last Jedi. Uh, at the risk of being very controversial, I low-key, it is my my favorite Star Wars movie since Empire. Yeah. Um, And it's like th- not particularly close for me. Yeah, I don't really think it's really that bad of it's a movie not. at all. It's not. Th- the, the the very weird casino subplot is bad, and well, that literally yeah. 
that literally could have been fixed if you just put Lando Calrissian in there instead of Benicio yeah. del Toro. Which don't get me wrong, Benicio del Toro in Star Wars, incredible, absolutely incredible. He chews up the scenery like the man has been playing Shakespeare for twenty years. But uh, no, I really enjoyed that. I've never been so upset at a movie as Episode Nine. I genuinely left the theater dejected. I was outright laughing by the end. I thought the entire third act is just un- almost unwatchable for me. You don't um, like the Raylo? You don't like Raylo? Uh, I have R- Raylo is one of three phrases that is muted on my uh, in my Twitter words, along with uh, Joe Rogan and uh, what was the other one? I'm pretty sure it was a spoiler for Destiny. I think I had a uh, hashtag uh, Destiny Two spoilers muted also, so I wouldn't see anything. So uh, yeah, <laughs> those, those it's it's in very exclusive company, as you can see. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, no, episode nine is is very bad. They did for everything that they did cool, which they would make one cool decision, and then they made like five terrible ones. Like um, the uh, I don't know how, but the emperor is, has returned. Oh my god! Somehow Palpatine returned. It's really bad that Palpatine's return was done in fucking Fortnite and not in the movies. Dude. That is unacceptable. JJ should never have been brought back for nine. I know he wasn't originally supposed to be there, but what did you expect when you put JJ Abrams in charge of finishing a trilogy? You gave him final cut privileges, which means that uh, the studio cannot overrule his decisions. And the screenwriter he brought along with him was the writer of Batman versus Superman. What could possibly have gone wrong here? Yeah. So (laughs) yeah. Uh, Find out next time on Dragon Ball Z. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's bad. Nine is an absolute abomination of a blockbuster for every bad blockbuster I've seen. I don't know that I've seen one as disappointing as, uh, episode nine. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like their post movie TV efforts have been pretty good though, for the most part. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, but like to get back to your original question, I'm, I'm excited about the poss- the storytelling possibilities of Ray coming back because that almost guarantees to me that, uh, John Boyega and Oscar Isaac will return. Um, Mm -hmm. All three of them have publicly stated in the past that they will only return to Star Wars if they are all together on the same project and that it had to be a movie. None of them were interested in doing TV. Uh, Oscar Isaac at one point was in talks to be in the Rogue Squadron movie, which was also supposed to be set post Rise of Skywalker. Mm -hmm. Um, John Boyega, if they do not, if they bring John Boyega back, I think that genuinely he's going to have it written into his contract. uh, Give me a fucking lightsaber. Um, yeah, genuinely I, one of the most disappointing to. things was to I like I think I think so he has to be I think he has to be her like apprentice or her sidekick or whatever. I mean, like, 15 years be. later, my man better be a Jedi master after 15 years. That's all I'm going to say. I I think that that's one of the things I was so excited about in the because the final trailer for The Force Awakens still gives me more chills than anything. Mm hmm. You know, when you see Boyega pull the lightsaber, he pulls the Skywalker saber out and him and Kylo go to fight. I've never, that was like, that was subverting the expectations so much. Right. And you're like, oh my God, like he's, he's actually the hero. Like he's the Jedi. Like he's on all the posters with the saber. But I'd be lying if I said that Ray pulling the saber, lifting the saber out of the snow and it flying into her hand was not one of with with the musical cue kicking in mm-hmm. was not one of the best scenes of that entire trilogy. Oh yeah, I get I, every time that I watch because I I still love watching that duel. That is one of my favorite shots ever in Star Wars. I think is her pulling because you see Kylo trying to pull it out right, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it flies right past. Kylo Ren's head and straight into Ray's hand. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that could have made this more delicious mm-hmm. was that they would have revealed that she was a solo twin. That's the only thing that could have made this more delicious for me. And of course they didn't do that. They had to make her a Palpatine. So I digress. Yeah. I digress. But, we have more questions to get to. Yeah. I'm going to get worked up and upset. I'm going to get worked up and upset, but yeah, no, the, <laughs> the lowdown excited about that. Stoked for the Filoni movie because it's going to end the Mandoverse uh, and it's basically heir to the Empire in all but name. And I'm extremely excited to see if James Mangold's movie about the Dawn of the Jedi ever actually gets made. Because I'm excited I'm, to see uh, James Mangold's uh, Indiana Jones movie. Uh, Indiana Jones 5 was definitely the highlight of that fucking panel, let me tell you. That looks okay. phenomenal. So, Corey and I may have to talk Indiana Jones in June. I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't go to the theater very often, Josh, but I already texted my dad and said, we're going to see this movie. 
Uh, my dad texted okay. me. He does not go to the movies. My dad sees approximately two types of movies. World War II movies and Navy movies. And mm-hmm. he texted me and was like, have you seen the trailer for Indiana Jones? And I was like, yeah. yes. As a matter of fact, I have. And he was like, I'll go see it. I was like, wait, that's because he punches Nazis. This technically qualifies as a World War II adjacent movie. We're good. <laughs> Here's the thing, Josh. Let me tell you the last four movies I saw in the theater. Okay. Okay. I'm almost afraid. Uh, Deadpool 2. Oh, boy. Infinity War. Oof. Endgame. Oof. And uh, the last 007 movie. For the last four movies I've seen in the theater. Wow. So when I go to the theater, it's a pretty big deal. I uh, have gone to the movies twice in 10 days. (laughs) I saw Dungeons and Dragons and Mario. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Zao asks us uh, if you could have the ultimate guardian exotics in every slot, no limits. What are your picks and why? Oh my god! Oh my god! I I don't even I don't even fucking know. Uh, Outbreak perfected. Yep. Uh, Telesto. Yeah, let's go. Let's go Telesto and uh, let's go Galley. Yeah, let's go Galley for heavy. Yeah. Um, I mean, for classics, I have no idea for class exotics, man. I can give you a couple. Helm of Helm of Saint fourteen on my head, Armamentarium on the chest, uh, Doomfang pauldrons on the shoulders. Dune Marchers on my feet. Oh, Corey already has the answer. Um, so I would go... God, this is really hard because like I'm trying to think of like elemental affinity and shit. Um, I would go... You think I have to give it all that thought, Josh? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have to... I probably have to go Celestial Nighthawk. Uh, I'd go Young Ahamkara Spine for the arms. I would go Gear Falcons for the chest. And I would probably go... Uh, Orpheus rigs for the legs, and I give me my exotic dead orbit cloak back from Destiny One. You fucks. Yeah, I'm still very worked up about that one. Yeah, still Where very are my upset. Exotic class items. Where are my exotic class items? Indeed. Uh, and then Zhao also asks, since you're such a big, it's, you're both such big fans of sandwiches. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No, no. it's a hot dog. It's a fucking hot dog, dude. Come Meat on. between bread as. Uh, Saint tries to argue, I, I think further down in the thread, that uh, just be, that because it's meat between uh, bread, that does not make it a sandwich. It's no. a fucking hot dog. It's an American institution. No. Also, it's I not called qualify- Portillo sandwiches. It's Portillo's hot dogs. I think I think to qualify as a sandwich, also the the bun has to be like the, the bread has to be two separate slices, not one that's you know you can peel open. I, man, I don't know because have you ever had like. A premium hoagie in your life? Yeah, I used to work at a restaurant for. Let me fuck. Years. Let me fucking tell you, man. Literally, I don't. Grinders. I don't want a hoagie that's been sawed all the way through. I want all that shit shoved in there with like I mean, some, yeah, some cut off right. on the ends. You're right. Like when you, yeah, you're right. I'm just you're saying. Right. I'm just saying. I want to feel disgusting eating that thing. You're right. I want. Well, I want to feel like a barbarian. I want to feel like a fucking barbarian with the toppings falling out. Um, <laughs> Hail Hydra. Hey, oh, Hail oh. Hydra fool asks us, uh, Ark Warlock still feels really bad. Would you, how would you fix it? Chaos Reach does not seem to compare to other DPS supers and speed boost. Don't help me get grenades out as fast as I used to be able to with Crown of Tempest. I'm going to try to answer this as best I can, given that, given that neither one of us plays Warlock. Um, let me tell you how to fix that, Josh. I have an answer for you. It's a quick oh, one. Oh, okay. Before you go. Okay. You go to your title screen. Okay. Okay, you hold down, you hold on square or X or delete or whatever it is. You delete that oh warlock and play a real class like Titan or Hunter. I fuck, I fucking hate you. <laughs> um, I, I think that the easiest solution would be to buff the DPS um, of Chaos Reach. Obviously, it, it's long since time for those nerfs to pass, um, at least in PVE, because um, Chaos Reach does fucking nothing. Um, I also think that it's time for the the uh, nerf to um, oh my god geomags to get reversed as well. It, it's it's time. It, it's it's beyond time. Um, I think that's probably the biggest problem with arc uh, warlock as it is because I mean I think I think the arc buddies still work really effectively in my opinion at least. 
Um, again, I'm kind of watching this from the sides, but uh, people that I know who used to love running Arc, Arc Warlock uh, all say, yeah, it pretty much blows. Um, I I don't really have a deep dive. Ron, Ronnie asked if we could get a deep dive into this. I don't really have one. And it's simply because we just don't play Warlocks. Um, that makes yeah. it a little bit harder to answer. Um, maybe we can get you a more in-depth uh, look at it from a, from a Warlocks perspective here in the next like week or two. Um, okay. I'll, I'll solicit some opinions this week and see what we can do. And yeah. I'll, I'll serve. I'm genuinely going to screenshot this and come back to it. Um, yeah. I would like to give you a better answer next week. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, I gave the best answer. But... Uh, Saint asks with the new artifact, uh, with new artifact mods, the solo dungeons are going to be a little bit tougher. Uh, which guardian and what loadout do you think is best for a solo dungeon? Uh, void hunter. I think void hunter and, uh, yeah, Void, Void Hunter is one. I think Solar Warlock is a tired and true one, obviously. Um, especially if you're spamming, the, you got the Fusion Aid builds uh, and uh, Wells that you can draw. I think both of those are old Reliables. They've kind of been the ones for the last several seasons. I mean, Void Hunter for forever, right? Um, in terms of loadout, I mean, it really depends on what dungeon you're doing. Um, but yeah, so, Solo Dungeons, I, I think those are still probably your two best options. Um, I'm going to default to Josh on this because, uh, yeah, um, I don't really try to solo dungeons. I'm going to completely honest. I know there's some people in the community who like to do it. Um, a lot of the runs that I see though, tend to be focused around void hunter. It's just simply because of the invisibility mm -hmm. and solar warlock because of the survivability. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think again, like this can be situational and change season to season. Like right now, Void Hunter is the best it's ever going to be with all the Void mods, with the free volatile rounds, with the bricks from beyond, and things like that. Like you're you're never going to have a better chance. All the insane amounts of uh, orbs you can create if there's Void shields around it, it's kismet. It's amazing. I I go through these battlegrounds making like 160 orbs. It's great. Um, these last two questions though. Um, are ones that I, Corey and I have definitely addressed in the past, um, but I, I always like bringing this. We we talk we seem to talk about this like once every six months or so. Uh, yeah. Through through no fault of y'all's. Uh, Tiger Jesus asks, when do you think we are getting a Destiny TV show or movie? You're not getting a movie. I'll tell you that no. right now. You're not getting a Destiny movie. You're gonna get some sort of anthology yep. show on yep. Netflix or whatever they decide. Yeah, you're you're gonna get it on some sort of streaming service. Um, mm -hmm. Again, please, I I beg you again, please hand it to an anime studio. Uh, I think well, that you. I mean, Bungie hired all those the people that did Arcane, right? A lot of the people that they hired they that hired show, the right? they so. hired the uh, the executive producer of Arcane, uh, the creator of Arcane, directly works yeah. at Bungie now, has for a while now, yeah. for about eight months, I think. Mm -hmm. So I would say you might get an announcement of it. I mean, my, my bet has continued to be that this fall you're going to get an announcement. I think in the lead up to Final Shape, you're going to get an announcement about it. At, even at just like a, hey, it's currently in production mm -hmm. thing. Um, and even if it gets announced this year, I think you're probably looking at like a twenty twenty spring 2025 as the absolute earliest this would come out. You think that long? Yes. If you're doing actual hand-drawn animation, it's going to take a while. So I'll put I'll put it this way: for a season of Demon Slayer, it takes about sixteen months, and that's with a story that already completely exists that you're adapting from a manga panel to animation. Yeah. And if you're going to do this, you need to do it right. You don't yeah. want to cut corners, even like on studios that don't take as much time. It's probably it's still about a year and a half between arcs usually for a full like. Now, granted, that's for a twenty-four episode season. If you're going to do this as an anthology and only do like eight episodes, you could probably get it done in 12 to 14 months. Um, but you would already need to, you would need to have a network lined up and everything in order to do it that quickly, um, yeah. which I have no doubt they would be ready to announce. If they're going to announce, it means they've already got talent lined up. They've already got scripts written. They just need to go into actual production on it. Yeah. Um, and I do think that some of this will be complicated by the fact you can't have Lance Reddick in it now. Yeah, oh, man. Um, because I mean that that was you know one of our ideas was you know his journey to the city. Um, because Knox also asks what storylines and or characters are most likely to be adapted or will be some completely original story. I don't think it's an original story. I think they're going to adapt stories from the lore that we've only ever read about. 
I wonder if we'll, you know, what would be a cool story actually would be the Iron Lords versus the Warlords at some point. I think that would be um, kind of a cool kind of beginning. Yeah. If, if I had to lay out a few that I think I've been very steadfast in believing that uh, the story of Shin Malfer will be told at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah the, the, the saga of the man with the golden gun, I think it's told at some point. Um, I think that Drifter's travels could be shown um when he explored outside of the uh the universe i would love to see um like you said i would like to see uh you know an iron lords story like i mean i think there's room to put shacks that shacks obviously knew them there's room to put shacks in there um shin probably crosses paths do you think they could explore like the elixir with the traveler um you could you could explore like the fall of Reese. Um, you yeah. could explore their golden age, the fall of Reese, and that that kind of veers into like original story territory. I think that that would be harder because you don't have a character outside of Aramis that you can really like anchor the story. Aramis and Tanix are kind of be the two that you can like anchor oh, the God. story in. We don't no, need like, more Tanix. No, but... like ser- seriously, no bullshit. No, no bullshit. Those are like the two characters you could really anchor it in, and like yeah. Athrax's mother, I guess. Yeah. If I was going to see an Elixni anthology, I would almost rather see a young Mithrax and a young Spider working together. Yeah. Um, I would like to see some of how Mara came to unite uh, the Reef mm-hmm. and uh, bring the House of Wolves into her uh, servitude. Um, I think there's some opportunity for like Varix to be a narrator for some of those storylines. Yeah. Um, Maybe the Crusades of Saint Fourteen would be something you could show. Um, if we're going to get into original stories, I think a story of like guardians that lost their light during the Red War and had to fight without the light, like we, you know, we got our light back, but nobody else did until the end. You know, maybe like you know some of them like leading a guerrilla resistance inside the city or something uh, yeah. could be really cool. I think that would be a really awesome storyline to show. Um, Maybe it's maybe the story behind the Vanguard Dare, um, you know, like Tales of the Vanguard or something uh, could be cool. I always wanted to see Zavala's journey because we've we've never really understood like his journey from obviously being an Awoken to coming back to coming back to Earth, roaming around when the Warlords were out and everything. You know, now we know about Sophia and um, his son dying. Um, but I would love to see his whole journey told told over like four to six episodes. I think that could have been really special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you, you could still do it. You could have somebody else narrating the story, really. Yeah. But you would I, still have to imitate Zavala's voice at some point, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, not to get too morbid and probably yeah. too soon to talk about this, but you think they would like reach out to his estate and say, hey, can we use AI to produce his voice for this? Um, Since he's I think so that important to that character. I don't think so. I think Bungie has too much respect to use AI to recreate his voice. Yeah. Um, given the stance they've taken on AI art alone, and yeah. how the entire industry is like against AI dialogue and stuff, I don't think that would happen. I think the more likely scenario is they get somebody who you know has a similar deep sounding voice, and they mm-hmm. just you know, hey, that you know this 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 season or this run of episodes is dedicated to Mary Lance Reddick. I think they would ask his uh, his estate for permission to do that. Right. Um, I don't think that they, and I think that they're going to be very sparing with how Zavala gets used past final shape. I do. Yeah. Because I, I don't, I think that if they were going to kill him off, they're almost certainly changing that plot point in my opinion. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think. I think they want to leave him in game as a memorial to the man that Lance was and what he meant yeah. to uh, the industry and to the game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, we'll we'll I, we'll see. Um, that would be my only prediction there. I still feel like bad talking about <laughs> Zavala. It, it's forward. yeah. It's. it's still I hard. mean, we're we're gonna have to at some point. Yeah. But I just I just I don't know. I I feel weird talking doing it right now. You know. Oh. I think that's it for our questions though tonight. I was looking to see if we had anything else. Uh, Knox came in right under the wire with that. Uh, with the question about the uh, what storylines would we want to see? Not that we wouldn't have already uh, been broaching that, but uh, right. I think yeah. that's going to do it for us. Yeah. Yep. We did it, Josh. We did it, Corey. We did it. 
Um, by the way, actually, there's something else I want to talk to you about that's not Destiny related. Well, it could be, maybe. Did you see that uh, Insider Gaming uh, kind of reported that Microsoft is playing around with a Windows U, uh, version for Steam Deck? I did. Um, so you can already you can you can put Windows on the Steam Deck, and it's not that hard to do. I know, but um, this is like an official kind of. Yeah, thing. I, I would like for it to be official. I think that opens up the compatibility of it much more, and I think that there would be certain games that you could boot up that would only be workable in Windows mode. Um, yeah. That they would just disable them in Linux mode. That's the that's the key reason why uh, Destiny Two isn't allowed to run on the Steam Deck officially is because Steam Deck is a Linux platform and not Windows. Mm-hmm. Um, but I there have been plenty of people at Bungie who have shared how to get it to work on Windows on your Steam Deck. Yeah, and have like officially said that they play it that way. Yeah. I'm looking at getting a Steam Deck this summer, and I'll 100 be doing these workarounds to get destiny working on it yeah i mean that's that's the big thing too like i kind of want to like play destiny and watch tv at the same time and i i mean well it's like that's... so you would you'd be capped at i think it falls right around like 40 frames is probably I mean, that's, what it falls that's i mean i'm not going to be like running raids or doing crucible or yeah anything. yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing, if you're just gonna... like doing like patrols or like story stuff then yeah yeah like bounties and 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 strikes and you know, that kind of stuff. I'm not going to be like serious gaming on it. It's just, you know, sometimes you want to play for like a half hour or 45 minutes before you go to bed to try to accomplish something. And like, you know, I want to lay down and turn on, turn on my favorite show, Josh, everybody loves Raymond and lay down <laughs> and, sh- and, sh- and shoot some cabal, you know, that's what I want to do. Man, everybody loves Raymond. Super underrated. <sighs> Or overrated, depending on which super side underrated. you fall on. It that show gets better as I get I, older uh, and have kids really... and, a, and a wife. <laughs> so I, I'm really looking Anyways. forward to uh, to being able to play Destiny on the go again. That's I think the mm-hmm. biggest loss from uh, Microsoft's cloud initiative was losing Destiny. I mean, obviously, like the, the contract ran out, right? So I got taken off Game yeah. Pass. I'm just waiting for them to officially come out we were supposed to get it last year it seems like it's definitely going to be something that comes out this year now um obviously yeah. uh you think they're of... utilizing the stadia tech you think Ooh, that's what they're doing i don't think so i think uh, no i think they've they've built their own infrastructure using azure um i think if anybody gets the stadia patents it's going to be uh sony that's going to pay out the ass for them um well well sony already sony already is in a contract with microsoft for azure stuff though yeah but i mean that doesn't mean that they can't use like stadia like the stadia tech to make games run like azure doesn't mean that i just think that microsoft was yeah. so far along that they've just built their this is what i always say like so- sony is a hardware company microsoft is a software company so yeah. like i of the two like who would i trust to make their own cloud solution without needing the google patents it's microsoft right now yeah i i think that google said that they'll let anybody pay them for the patents they won't restrict it to just one company so it's entirely possible microsoft could do it but i don't think that they will i think they've got their own solutions yeah where i see the stadia tech being used a lot with is studios uh like bungie doves have been very 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 clear about how stadia really helped them with uh going full remote from home uh, in yeah. terms of development, sharing sharing dev builds and whatnot, there was a whole dev mode that we couldn't see to Stadia, and right. that's why so many developers were upset about it going away. Yeah, man, I'm excited. R.A.P. Stadia. R.A.P. The Dream. Oh God. Yeah. Well. All right, was Corey. Stadia, was was Stadia the dream or? Yeah. It's all right. Anyways, get all us right. out of here. Yeah, get we're us out of here. here. We're leaving. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of uh, Tower Casuals. Uh, if you like the show, rate us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, the sweet, sweet five stars, even though we <laughs> only talked about 20 minutes of Destiny on this <laughs> almost two-hour episode. Uh, there wasn't much to talk about. <laughs> I know. And look, Josh and I like to talk about other games also. and We do. I, You know, Josh and I always joke around that, like, if... You know, we he wasn't so busy, and I wasn't running my other podcast. We'd have gamer casuals where we'd have conversations like that a lot. But um, yeah. Anyways, this was our gamer casual episode for the next three months, I guess. Uh, Josh, where can we find you? <laughs> uh, Twitter at Josh, Josh underscore Finn two ends, and of course in the Discord. 
Join the Discord. Join the Discord. I post a link every day to social media. So no excuse. It's also in the show notes. You can also click it there. You can find me at I am Corey HD. (laughs) Yeah. Shout out. Colonel Panic. Uh, you can find me at I am Corey HD on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow Tower Casuals at Tower Casuals on most social media networks. Uh, join the Discord. I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening. And until next time, we love you. Goodbye. <laughs>